talking about Marvel Season 1. Uh, so I decided to break this up into chunks. I didn't think each book warranted its own video, so I'm gonna do two at a time. Um, so today we're gonna be covering Spider-Man and Ant-Man. Uh, I figured it worked. Theme of bugs and such, you know. Uh, so the next one following this should be The Incredible Hulk and Thor. Um, and then after that will be Avengers and X-Men. So I'm pretty excited. Um, as I believe I've stated this before, but season one is pretty good stuff. Uh, it's the Marvel equivalent to DC's Earth One. Uh, it's just like a spin-off series they did where they can just do um, not what-if stories, but um, almost like a modernized origin or new beginning of a story, if you will. So with this one, I've got my notes here. Uh, overall, I thought it was good. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, it was a good take on the classic Spider-Man origin. You know, uh, typically Spider-Man's origin has been more or less the same throughout the years and the different variations of Spider-Man. Uh, like if you look at the Ultimate Universe, it was almost beat by beat the same kind of thing. It's no different with this. Um, it doesn't do anything crazy to stand out from other origin stories uh, for Peter Parker or Spider-Man. Um, but I, I still found it to be an enjoyable story. Um, so if you'll see up here, the writer is Cullen Bunn and the artist is Neil Edwards. Now, Neil Edwards I'm not too familiar with and, and I can't, I don't recognize the name uh, and other things he's done, but Cullen Bunn I know because he did, uh, he did Venom for a while. He wrote for Venom, uh, when the flash, the version of Venom, when Flash Thompson used the symbiote to be like a U.S. agent type dude. Uh, so I've, I've read through some Bullen stuff before and, uh, I actually really like what he did with Venom. So I was excited to read it when I saw his name. Uh, let's see what else. Uh... Like I said before, I've never, I don't recognize Neil Edwards' name. I couldn't tell you anything else he's drawn, but uh, I really, I think the art works for this book. There's a couple shots like this where it really sets itself apart from the rest of the book. And even uh, the stuff in the rain right here, I thought was really cool looking. Um, so overall, between the writing and um, the art, I thought it was a really good book, uh, just based on those two things. Um, yep, covered that. Yeah, some shots stand out more than others, and that's not to say that the rest of the book is drawn poorly or anything like that. It's just when he does those big shots, he makes them look really good. Um, so huge positive, huge like points for that guy, you know, Neil Edwards, cool dude, uh, based on this at least. Uh, so the biggest difference I found, at least with this kind of origin story or this take on the origin, was how fast the dude blows up. Um, so it's a typical thing where he's got like a field trip at like a sciencey thing or whatever. And then kind of overnight he's blowing up. He's, uh, he did like a wrestling match or something like that. And then he gets an agent who gets him on these talk shows and stuff. And he starts promos. Um, you'll see in this shot right here, he's actually at the mall doing promos for motorcycles and stuff. So I think, uh, just the speed at which he really picked up with the public and stuff and got popular is... One of the main differences um, that sets it apart from the other origin stories, you see here, this is basically exactly what happens in Spider-Man 1, directed by Sam Raimi. He finds uh, the dude, and it was somebody he could have stopped earlier in the movie, and you know, obviously he kills Uncle Ben and whatnot. So he finds him and then beats him up, beats him up pretty good actually. You see he's throwing down the spider smackdown. Um, and then ultimately he decides to let him live and he wraps them up in some webs real nice for the police. So this is pretty cool. Um, yep, sensation. And uh, one of the other things, so Uncle Ben actually references a lot taking pictures and stuff to try and like help out with the bills and whatnot before he gets shot and dies. Um, so that was pretty new. So that kind of gives Peter the inspiration afterwards when he's looking for a job. That's how he ends up working for the Daily Bugle taking pictures of Spider-Man and Vol Vulture. Uh, so that was pretty interesting. I thought that was pretty fun. Um, so, yeah, overall thoughts. Uh, like I said, it was really good. I really liked it. Um, like I said, it didn't do anything too crazy or innovative, and it didn't really do anything different with the character, but that's okay. You don't need something different every time. Something Sometimes just like a modernized twist on like a classic stories, that's all you really need. 
Um, I thought the book showed everything that makes Spider-Man a great character. I thought it really went to the, like, almost like the roots of the character, you know. It, the Uncle Ben death is really important and something the MCU is lacking. Um, because it's more than just, yeah, his uncle died again. But it's, it, that's where he gets his sense of responsibility. He could have stopped his uncle's death, but he chose not to because of ignorance and, uh, not ignorance, but like arrogance and just pride and whatever. Um, and that's important because it really establishes, like I said, that character's sense of responsibility. Um, so, like I said, that's missing from the MCU movies. Um, Incredible Intelligence, I believe I showed us a part where he's messing with some kind of device. And it's a device that he creates in order to... Let me see if I can find it. Basically, he figures out the vulture's things from them, like electromagnets or something like that. So he creates a device that he can smack on the vulture that will disrupt his wings and stop him from flying. Well, now all of a sudden I can't find it. That's not cool. Give me one second. Um, so yeah, he gets his butt kicked right here and he tries to figure out a plan on how to fight him. There he is. So this device is what he sticks on the vulture at the end um, to stop him from flying and he beats him up. He puts a smack down on him. You can see that right here with all the electricity and whatnot. Um, and then the making his own equipment, uh, I guess that kind of goes into that, and the knack for building things, and he, like, uh, again, this sticks to the true, like, uh, edit, like, the true character, so he does make his own webs and things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I'm, at this point, I'm just repeating myself, like, I really enjoyed it, I thought it was good. Um, now let's move on to Ant-Man. So, also, season one book, as you can see written by Tom DeFalco and Horatio Dominguez. Now, those neither of those names really mean anything to me, but um, based on the book, I, I don't know, I would give them a chance if they were on something and I was curious about it. The art's all right. I don't think it's as good as uh, Neil Edwards, but it does work for what it is, um, especially shots like this. Like, this is pretty cool. Uh, for context, Hank Pym goes a little nuts and nobody believes him because um, they believe he's paranoid and stuff like that. So, yeah, the, uh, he tries to get somebody to admit to something that he, they didn't actually do and they had him wrapped up. And this is a cool shot of like the giant wasps that uh, Egghead creates. So, uh, like I said, it's a decent story and uh, the art's all right. You know, found it enjoyable at the very minimum. Uh, I'm not super familiar with Ant-Man as a character or his origin. Um, now, for all the normies and or casuals out there, this is a original uh, Ant-Man. So this is going to be a story about Hank Pym. Uh, this has no relation to uh, Scott Lang at all. He's not mentioned in the book. He's not... I don't know if they had any plans to bring him in. Actually, in contrast, um, Goliath is in here. Uh, Bill Foster. So uh, he's actually like a hired assistant that's helping out... Um, Hank Pym. Um, in the story, he's depicted as a paranoid scientist recovering from the death of his wife. Um, him and his wife were out of country doing some kind of like science retreat or something like that, or she was going to reveal some technology to the world, and um, she gets blown up. Uh, the reason he survives is because he's late to dinner. So he's dealing with that and that kind of depression and that, psycho like that psychological trauma. Sorry is uh, actually like a leading thing in this story because uh, nobody wants to believe him when he actually finds evidence of things because they think he's just nuts. He's already had a mental break. He's already got a, like a health of men or uh, a history of mental illness or whatever. Um, so everybody just, you know, he's talking here and he's said something about six months he's been depressed, uh, six months since his wife died. Um, and this goes into the paranoia aspect. As soon as he meets Bill Foster, he assumes his dad hired him to spy on him. Um, and so prior to the explosion, Hank Pym and I believe Maria is his wife that dies. Um, yeah, Maria. So they were both scientists. That's how they met. And, um, so his dad, Warren, uh, basically forces him to come back and go be a scientist for egg. I think it's like egg, egg ink or something like that. When, you know, the egg man, this dude right here, this bad guy. Um, and essentially, he finally finishes his research and he figures out how to isolate the PIM particles without Bill Foster's help. He's staying after hours to do this stuff. And as soon as he cracks it, he sends Eggman 
or Eggman sends his goons in and they shrink him and they think they kill him. Um, so now he's the size of an ant trying to figure out what to do in life. Um, he ends up fighting a spider. <laughs> the spider actually chases him into an ant hill where uh, he finds a match and um, he kills the spider. <laughs> it's just, I think that's pretty cool because it's so goofy, you know, something we don't think about in our everyday lives. It's just like a spider or whatever, you know, it's just a spider, but it is literally going to eat this dude. And uh, he, so he stabs it and he leaves it for the ants. I thought that was a pretty cool little detail. And um, as soon as they you know, take care of Hank or whatever, they fire Bill Foster. So that's him down there getting fired. And um, so Hank sees this and he jumps in his box and goes home with him. He jumps out of his place. He's like, yo, <laughs> stand back. I'm going to use my grow particles and hopefully they work. <laughs> So the pin particles in this, um, at least in the, so in the MCU, I believe they're, it's depicted like a liquid and it, I don't really understand how it works. It just kind of, he just pushes the button and he shrinks. Uh, in this, it's a push a button to release gases and the gases, there's one each. So there's a grow gas and there's a shrink gas. So that's what this is on. Um, so out of spite, cause he's really angry. He's gonna, he builds this protective suit and the protective suit is actually for the ants. It's not for people or bullets or anything like that. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And the helmet is actually Maria's idea. And he decides he's going to finish her work, uh, bring it to life, and use it to go get revenge. Because he believes at this point that Eggman is behind, um, basically behind the bombing. Because he was jealous of the technology or some such. So he suits up and he's practicing. He goes and into an ant hill. Um, ultimately tuning his helmet to the right frequency to communicate with the ants and then yeah he jumps the guards and this is what I showed earlier more or less once he's done putting the smack down on the guards um, Warren shows up he's like talking to him or whatever and while he's distracted Bill Foster hits him with a tranquilizer which is right here hits him with the tranquilizer and then that's when they lock him up but they don't want to turn him over to the authorities because then a bunch of other stuff is gonna happen uh, so moving forward, Eggman takes the helmet and he tries to modify it so he can talk to all insects because that's his ultimate goal. And he's talking about here how like just like in the Ant-Man movie, instead of shrinking people though, you shrink you, you just use the insects to do your dirty work. So here he's talking about like eating fuel lines or brake lines or whatever. This one is like you can po put poison on the wasps stingers. Same thing with here. And um, this is him demonstrating his control over them by having them swarm somebody and kill him. Um, so ultimately he escapes via some gases he hid in his boot after he breaks out of the chair. And that's the giant wasp I showed earlier. And this is kind of like Bill Foster realizing like, hey, this guy's evil, I need to go help Hank. And so that's what this is about. Um, and this is kind of cool. This is a little thing to demonstrate um, essentially, if they're close enough, the particles will work on multiple people, so that was pretty cool. So he shrinks down and they escape together, getting chased by giant wasps through the city. It's pretty goofy if you ask me. Uh, could you imagine? So he goes back, fixes his helmet after um, escaping and all that, and <laughs> Eggman sends all these giant bugs after him. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty wild. And he actually gets the idea from Bill he decides to grow and start smashing bugs and stuff. So after this, he uh, shrinks back down, jumps on the flying ant, and heads back to the lab so he can do his showdown with Eggman. And so this was actually one of my criticisms with the book, something I didn't like about it, is the ending felt very rushed. So, um, yeah, Eggman's got him in a position, he's smacking him up and stuff, he's got him in a position where he's gonna kill him, and his dad steps in the way and takes the shot for him so Hank, Hank can get away. And um, as you can see, Hank puts the beat down on <laughs> him. So at this point, um, like, I, like I said, this is where it starts to get rushed. Like he realizes, he goes over and he's like, oh, you're, you know, he's gone, he's dead. And then very next page, he's just like, yeah, I'm just going to go be Ant-Man then. Like there's no kind of resolution. You never find out who killed Maria. You never figure out like... I, I don't know, it just seemed like very sudden and just kind of just end, you know? I, I'm not a fan of the way it wrapped up, but I like the story. I just didn't like how it, again, I just didn't like how it finished. Um, 
So uh, the other thing that made, other than the ending, uh, that made this not as good in my opinion as the Spider-Man one is, uh, so the villain of this is clearly and obviously just a copy and paste of Ant-Man. Uh, just another dude with some growing particles making himself and just other things giant and small. Uh, something that uh, was different about the Spider-Man one because obviously he fights the Vulture and he's got to use his smarts to outsmart him with technology and all that kind of stuff. Um, so again, overall I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a fun read. Um, like I said, I don't know much about the Ant-Man character, Hank Pym or Scott Lang otherwise, or either of them, really. Um, so I did enjoy it and I felt like um, reading a story about a character I didn't know about personally uh, was pretty interesting because you know you get a different perspective on the character. Um, and I, I love learning about new characters. I like reading things I wouldn't normally read and stuff like that. And that's pretty much what most of season one is. Um, most of the season one titles I would never go out and buy to read. Like Thor uh, never really interested me. Iron Man has never been that big of a hero uh, to me. Uh, the X-Men are hit or miss. I think some of their stories sound pretty cool, but overall just never really hit it off with me. Uh, especially Doctor Strange, and that's one of the most expensive ones in the bunch. Uh, just never really interested me. Um, the character, like I said, just character just never really interested me, even with the MCU and all that stuff. Um, so that's something I can't appreciate about season one is they're so limited and they're, there's only one, so I really want to get out there and I want to read them and in turn I'm learning about characters I wouldn't otherwise learn about. So that's pretty cool. Overall, um, I said this in the beginning of the video, but this was Marvel's attempt at copying the Earth One books that DC had put out earlier, which I own all of those, so I'll be covering those uh, maybe medium shortly. Uh, maybe once I've wrapped up with the current season one books I do own. Um, and like I said, so far I've enjoyed what I've read and I'm gonna keep reading them, hunting them down. Uh, I think I found one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven. So I need, I think, four more. Uh, I'm not entirely sure though. Um, and I mentioned this at the beginning of the video also, but the next video should be uh, Thor and the Incredible Hulk, followed by the X-Men and the Avengers season one books. Um, so yeah, you can look forward to that. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed, and uh, if you watched the video, thank you so much. See you next time.